first, I'll give all of you something to ponder while I'm talking. Here is an item that I purchased recently. It weighs about a pound. I'll, I'll ask for a few people to take guesses at the end as to what, what this might be. Uh, or at least you, whether it's a product or a package, OK? Well, the most exciting news in the uh, plastic bags ban uh, category is the fact that we've just had this decision after a three-year battle in Manhattan Beach versus the Save the Plastic Bags Coalition, which sounds to me like an industry front group, probably is. They're very good at forming those types of organizations and uh, trying to neutralize campaigns. In this case, it was a small town, about 35,000 people. They found that a town of that size could pass the ban without doing an environmental impact report, which is the thing that the Save the Bags uh, Coalition uh, has been using to, to stop towns from doing this because of the cost. So far, we, we don't really know how this will work for larger jurisdictions. That remains to be seen. On the strength of that decision, which was only, I think, about a month ago, the latest two bans are Bellingham, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and many others are pending. Thanks to Portia, this is her summary of single-use bag bans and fees that have been adopted around the world. The global to total 134. Uh, you can see a lot of action in California. A uh, few examples of different types of locations that have done this. The history. Just briefly, I'm an old campaigner. Uh, we actually had our first round of styro bans in or starting around 1986 and 87. And that's when we, uh, without the internet or any social uh, organizing, we had what we call Take the Rap campaign. And that's when people from all over the country wrapped up their plastic trash in big boxes and mailed it to the headquarters of the Society of the Plastics Industry. That definitely got their attention. And in fact, they, for a period of about five years, they funded a great deal of really good uh, R&D looking into how, you, how can recycling systems really work, how can you do collections. And, and this was a lot of the early work that, that helped advance things into the mid-90s before globalization really reversed everything. The difference now, of course, is that we have ground, we can do ground swells, we can drive them crazy with uh, movements and campaigns of all types. One example I just learned about yesterday, a school, a, a class of fourth graders, petitioned the San Diego Unified School District for a ban of the styrofoam lunch trays that are used there. And the school board honored the petition and called for a study of alternatives, which is a good first step. I will point out, however, that we went through this whole exercise in San Diego from 1988 until about 1994, negotiating with uh, the styrofoam industry. And eventually, they just kept selling the trays in the schools, and nothing changed. So I think one thing I will point out is that the plastic industry has its tentacles are many and long, and they can outmaneuver you, they can outlast you, they can outspend you, they can outinvent you and constantly come up with these ridiculous things, you know, that have no future use. They just get into the gyre, you know, or uh, who knows where these things go. So I still feel that it's very important to continue to build the recovery infrastructure for plastics. Here are some key groups in California that have worked on ban campaigns. And uh, there are many more, but this is what I had ready at hand. The industry can outmaneuver, outinvent, but we have to still remember that there is a, a huge amount of plastic that can be recycled. And we shouldn't discount that role of recycling. This bag. When I move to Berkeley, we can do yard waste, we can do food, we can do soil paper, tissue papers, and uh, most of the regular recyclables. Once I sorted all those out, I found out, and plastic bottles is the only uh, category of plastics taken in Berkeley. 
when I sorted all of the other things out, put, put the paper in the, the compost, this is what I had left. And it's, you know, uh, this is for about three months, one person who tries not to buy, pla buy plastic. Thank you. Um, and you can see, well, maybe you don't know, I know this because I've worked on plastics many years. Most of this is polypropylene, all one plastic. A lot of it has no pigment. It's perfect material to recycle. And so I, I, I just think we haven't given recycling its uh, full potential. More needs to be done to stem the flow of plastics to the oceans and counter the many other negative impacts. Maximize recovery in the US. I really believe strongly that we should try to make local loops as, off, as much as possible, keep materials here so they aren't falling off container ships in, you know, in the middle of the ocean. And there are some well-proven plastics recycling technologies that have been around since actually the 70s. Some of these are, they're generally not known. In the 90s, I wrote a series of articles about a bunch of European technologies that I studied. Some of those are still the best in the world. This is a, a plastics recycling plant designed by Serema of Italy, Como Italy. They can design for any type of plastic film or multiple lines of different plastic resins and they recover pure resin pellets. Here's Aldo Previero, one of the family that started that company. Their first plastic that they took was the hardest of all. That's agricultural film, you know, the mulch film. That's, and uh, they started, started with that. Uh, they have plants all over the world, and much of that plastic is reused. It doesn't necessarily get downgraded and have only one life. I think that's one thing that people do need to understand. I'm not a, I don't love plastic, I hate it. You know, I'm not an apologist for the industry, but it's a, a resource extracted from oil or natural gas, and we should not throw it away after one use. So mixed plastic shouldn't be uh, denigrated quite as much as it is, because there are, uh, the majority of mixed plastic products are long life, durable, things that will stay in situ indefinitely. And actually, these things can be recycled at the end of their useful life into a new mixed plastic product. I think my main point is we need many strategies. We, we don't have another planet to go to. And we have huge opportunities now, especially for young people entering the field. We need all kinds of new things invented, new uses for these materials, new types of campaigns. Our world is changing so rapidly. Who knows what tools will work next? What I do want to say, I quote Tom Padilla, who said, we humans made this mess, and we have the capability to get out of it. Now, would anyone like to uh, take a guess at what this? It's a, it's a ribbon dispenser. Ribbon dispenser? That's good. There's a s cylinder there, but no. A watch? You're right. A watch. This watch. It took me about an hour just figuring out how to open it. Then there was this little bitty watch and a tiny uh, pamphlet folded up the size of a postage stamp that was the uh, warranty, you know. And, uh, well, I rest my case. <laughs>